Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. So I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. As we do, I'd like to ask if you would, be, if you would stand, if you're able to stand and join me. Let's prepare our hearts to hear the Word of God and, and to receive the Word of God. I'm going to take this off because first service, I was sweating like a pig. Thank you. And I don't want to do that again. So I'm going to get down on my knees. Father, in the name of Jesus... We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here today, Lord. We thank you that we have the freedom to come and to worship you, to lift you high, to magnify, and to, to hear your word, Lord, without fear of persecution, Lord, without, without fear of retaliation. But, Lord, today we thank you that we have the ability to come and to hear from you. We don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman, the old or the young. Lord, we don't come for tradition or ritual sake or, 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 or for entertainment, for that matter. But, Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ that's the senior leader of this church. And, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus. We ask that your precious Holy Spirit would be our counselor today, would be our guidance to show us your word, to, to equip us to be uh, full-time ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with today, Lord, and all the blessings that you've given to us. We don't ever think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So, Lord, we thank you that you would bless all our brothers and sisters, our denominational brothers and sisters, our Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord, the Baptist and the Lutheran and the Presbyterian, Lord. We thank you for the Methodist and Evangelical and, and Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, Lord. We thank you for our, our neighbors in the Inland Empire. Lord, we list, ask that your hand would be upon harvest in the grove and sandals. Lord, on the well and the way. Father, we thank you for Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist for victory. Lord, we lift up a, a new creation to you, Lord. Oak Valley, we lift up abundant, li abundant life to you, Lord. We thank you, God, that your hand would be upon our brothers and sisters. So at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else. But rather, we are co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, we thank you. Have your will, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. As you're taking your seats, get your Bibles out. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to continue our study on the book of Hebrews. Yesterday was a different message from Lisa Bevere, so you guys are the lucky ones, the spiritual ones, the dedicated ones, to come and to get more of the Word of God. And we're going to resume Hebrews in the 10th chapter. I'm excited about the Word of God today. I believe it's really going to impact our lives, yours and mine alike. So as we get into the Word of God, I'm going to give you the title of this morning's message. The title, if you're taking notes, is The Faithfulness of and to our God. The faithfulness of and to our God. We're going to discuss some things in, in greater detail today. And as we look at the Bible, and we're going to get to our, our, our reference today, or our scriptural topic today, in Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 23. Leaving off from where Pastor Jim left us last week, he, he referenced this verse, and we're going to just look at some things today. Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 23 says, Let us hold fast. Let us hold on to have a firm grip to not let go of our confession of our hope without wavering, going to the left or to the right, but staying on course. For he who promised is faithful. Speaking of God, God is a faithful God. You know, the thing about a promise, here the, the Word of God is telling us our, we have a, a, a something to hold on to. The Bible talked about it in Hebrews and as an anchor for our soul. Something to hold on to that he who promised, God who promised is faithful. You know, the thing about a promise is, it is as only as good as the promiser. Let me give you an example. Right now, if I was to come and I was to say, hypothetically speaking, all right, this is a metaphor. I am going to give every person in this auditorium right now a thousand dollars. Praise God, hallelujah. Until I had to write the first check. You know why? The promise is only good as the promise. I don't got it. Sorry. It's the thought that counts. But let's just say, let's just say somebody like Bill Gates or one of the world's richest men came and I just said, you know, I just so appreciate what's going on here in San Bernardino and the move of God here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. You guys faithfulness to come and to hear the word. I want to bless you. I'm going to give each and every person in this room $1,000. We would holler or hoot a little bit more. Why? Because we know he's good for it. From the 72 trillion something dollars that is to his name, we know that his bank account can handle the what, 
2,600 people, 2,500 people, so that's $25,000 check that it would be. That's awesome. Pastor Luke, on the other hand, not going to work. $250,000. I can, I can add. I just have to take my shoes off. The promise is only as good as the promiser. But you see, God made it so we have a consolation of hope because one could say it like this, that God went out of his way to ensure that we have something to hold fast to. We saw this in Hebrews in the sixth chapter as God was promising to Abraham. Hebrews in the sixth chapter, the, the Bible tells us to God's promise to Abraham. Hebrews in the sixth chapter, verse number 17, it says, Thus God determined to show more abundantly, over and above, to go out of his way, the heirs to the heirs of promise, the immu immutability of his counsel, confirmed by an oath, Verse number 18 goes, that by two immutable things, God's promise, God's oath, and the fact that it is impossible for God to lie, we, you and I, might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. You see, God literally went out of his way to ensure the promises are backed by God Almighty, by swearing by himself. He did not have to swear to his, himself. He did not have to promise. Nobody obliged God, but God, out of the fullness of his heart, out of the, his love for Abraham and for the seeds of Abraham, you and I, the heirs of the promise, God promised over and above. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans in the fourth chapter, I'll just refer to it for your sake. Romans in the fourth chapter tells us that the promise of Abraham was not written just for Abraham, but for us, his seed, either by lineage or by faith, meaning the promises of Abraham were not recorded or written just for his sake so that he would have consolation, but were written and recorded so that you and I would have a strong consolation of the hope that was set before us. God literally went out of his way so that we would understand and know that God is faithful. God is faithful. As a matter of fact, Paul tells the young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, he says, listen to these faithful statements. And one of these faithful statements, he says, if we are faithless, yet he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Revelation in the 19th chapter, speaking of Jesus, says, now I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse and he, Jesus, who sat on him, the horse, was called faithful and true. One of the very names of Jesus is faithful and true. You see, God is faithful. God is faithful. We have learned through the course of the book of Hebrews that God is faithful. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews, the third chapter, we have a hope to hold on to because God is faithful. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter, we have a hope to hold on to because God is faithful. In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and uh, God is faithful. In Hebrews, the seventh chapter, God is faithful. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, God is faithful. In Hebrews, the tenth chapter, God is faithful. We have discussed over and over again in the book of Hebrews the very faithfulness of God. So today, as I titled the message, The Faithfulness of and To, I want to flip the, the coin and look to the other side. And because God is faithful to you and I, what does that mean to us in our lives? So we're just going to give three simple things of the faithfulness of God. And because God is faithful, what does that mean to you and I? Can, can, can we... Can we, can we talk today? Yes? Amen. Because God is faithful today, first and foremost thought for this morning, because God is faithful, we must be faithful to God. Because God is faithful to us, we must be faithful to God. God came and he brought at the fullness of time Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. He, he lived up to his word. He, he fulfilled the prophecies and now the Savior has been sent. You and I don't live in a time where, oh, well, Jesus came, died on the cross. That means that we get to do whatever we want. We get to do however we want. We get to think whatever we want. We get to live. And at the end of it, God, God loves his love wins. We'll all find in the same way. It does not work like that. 
God is faithful to us in turn. We must be faithful to God. As a matter of fact, let's go back to the, the topical verse for this morning in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Can I ask you a question? It's not a trick question. Do you know who the book of Hebrews was written and targeted to? Anybody? Hebrews! You're like, wow, really? I didn't know that. That's why it's called Hebrews. It was literally written to Jewish believers. Hebrews. And let, let, let's look at this, this statement. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. You see, in America, in our day and age, in our society, where we live, Christianity is, there's some two billion Christians or self-proclaimed Christians around the world today. We live in a time where in order to, to be a Christian says, okay, I belong to a group or, or this is my beliefs and, and it's okay. Okay, they're over here, they're over here. People may not like or may not, may not understand, but it's, it's not, let's just say it like this, it's not a big deal, so to speak, in, in, to the world. But in, in, in 62 to 67 AD, when, when Hebrews was penned, okay, you, there was the, the term Christian had not yet come around. You were a Jewish believer of Jesus Christ, a follower of Christ. And in order to be a Christian or a Jewish follower of Christ literally meant excommunication from society. You were rejected. You had to give up or surrender everything that you knew. As a matter of fact, there was a man in the Bible whose name was Saul. We know him as Paul. Saul literally sought out to seek and arrest and persecute and even kill Christians or followers of Christ. So if this verse is speaking to that very group of people, hold fast. Don't let go of letting go. of You've already let go of everything. You've already sacrificed your life. Don't leave it. Hold on to it. Then how much more to you and I in our day and age when we have the freedoms to go before God, to worship God without fear of persecution in our great nation, how much more then does that mean to us that we should be faithful to God? God is faithful to us. Therefore, we must be faithful to God. J. Oswald Chambers, in his book, My Utmost for His Highest, says this. Being faithful to Jesus Christ is the most difficult thing we try to do today. We'll be faithful to our work, serving others, or anything else. Just don't ask us to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Many Christians become very impatient when we talk about faithfulness to Jesus. Our Lord is dethroned more deliberately by Christian workers than by the world. We treat God as if he are a machine designed only to bless us. And we think of Jesus as just another one of his workers. The goal, he goes on and he says, the goal of faithfulness is not that we will do the work of God, but that he will be free to do his work in us. The goal of faithfulness to God and remaining faithful is not that we do the work to God. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. It is not our works. It is not lest anybody should boast, but we remain faithful to God even when it's difficult, even when it doesn't, we don't feel like it, even when the situation seems dire. We say, God, I will hold on and I will remain faithful. Why? Because it is not about what we do for God. It is being available and faithful so that God can work through and in us. James in the fourth chapter. James in chapter number four. Speaking to the church, verse number four says, Adulterer and adulteresses. What? You talking to me? You talking to me? Yeah. Adulterers and adulteresses, he says. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Church, it is time for us, you and I, to shed apathy in our Christianity. No longer should Christianity be about our attendance on a Sunday morning or what we do on a Wednesday night. Our Christianity, our belief, should be about the faithfulness of God in our hearts, in hard and in good times, because we are no longer of the world. We are of God. 
The Bible says, or do you not think that the scripture says in vain that he yearns for us jealously? God's desire is to be the love of our life. Uh, the Bible says that his name is jealous. He is a jealous God for our attention, for our desire. We have got to stop viewing God as something that we will try. I remember there was a man that was a, that was a, a, a friend of a friend. And he was at our house and he, his life literally had hit rock bottom. His relationship fell apart. His, his economics were, were not doing so well. And, and he had recently gone to church and given his heart to the Lord. I was talking to him and I says, well, tell me about it. So he tells me about it and tells me about the church that he's been attending. And I ask him, so well, what happens if your relationship and your economics don't turn over right away, if, 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 if it takes some time? And he says to me, well, if God doesn't come through, I'm trying it out. If God doesn't come through, I'll just go back to what I was doing before. We cannot try God. It is not like a Hollywood marriage relationship. I'll give him five years and see what he does. There is no divorce in our relationship with God. We have got to understand we have to remain faithful to God. We'll see that later in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Some of the fear of the Lord put inside of us. We do not try God. A, 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 vis, a, a, a verse that is difficult for us Christians to to, to swallow, so to speak, is Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter. I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through. For God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to Him. When you sat there, and if you haven't done this yet, we'll give you the opportunity. When you gave Christ your heart, you made a vow to be a part of the family. You became the bride of Christ. There is no divorce in the marriage of Jesus and his church. We are united to him. Therefore, when we make a promise to God, we have got to remain faithful to God in all things in our life. Are you guys with me today? I know you're thinking, you're like, man, Pastor Luke, you made me, you made me jump. You got on me about exhortation, about giving God glory. And now, and now you're talking about this. I really should have gone somewhere else today, but praise God you are here today. Because God is faithful, second thought for this morning, because God is faithful, number two, we must be faith-filled. We must be faith-filled. you got to feed your faith. What you put in is what you get out. I'm the kind of person that I know exactly when my gas light comes on, how many miles I have in my tank. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? That gas light comes on and praise the Lord, I got 2.2 gallons left when that gas light comes on. Now, if I'm going downhill, it's roughly about 1.9. If I'm going uphill, it's, it's, it's roughly about 2.5. All right, so there's a give and take, which means I've got about 40 miles, maybe 45 miles that I can drive. So then you know what I do? I get on my phone and I look, where's the nearest gas station 44.5 miles away? You know, you're laughing because you know you're doing the same thing. You're looking at your odometer. That's the only time I ever look at my odometer is when my gas light's on. We put gas in our cars in order for it to go. you got to fill up your gas tank for the car to run. What you put into your spirit, your body, you fill it up with cookies and milk, three meals a day, Sugar, 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 soda all day long. Guess what? It's not going to be long before your teeth are falling out, before you're gaining some weight, before you have no more energy. What you put in is what you get out. And it is exactly that with our faith. We have to feed our faith, continually filling it up with the things of God, not speaking what the world says, not listening to what people around us. Don't you know when somebody gets sick or one of your kids gets sick, you hear somebody, oh, well, I heard about somebody over on the other, other side of the United States. Their kid died from that we got to stop feeding our faith with what somebody else said in the passing and start focusing on what the Word of God says in our lives. I had referred earlier to Romans in the fourth chapter. Let's just turn there. Romans in the fourth chapter, speaking of the promise of God to Abraham of his inheritance. Romans in the fourth chapter, verse number 19. Romans chapter 4, verse number 19 says, speaking of Abraham and the promise to God, Abraham, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. God saying, you're going to have a son. I'm 100 years old, God. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. She can't have babies. He did not consider 
these things. But rather, verse number 20, did not waver at the promise through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. You know what that means? That, it means that Abraham, when he woke up in the morning and he still felt like he was 100 years old, when Sarah woke up in the morning and still realized that her womb was dead, that they didn't look at their age, they didn't look at how they felt and feed themselves based on the circumstances, but they said, no, God promised it will come to pass. For he who promised was faithful. And they strengthened themselves in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham filled himself up, fed his faith on the promises of God. Verse number 21, and being fully convinced that he had promised was also able to perform. Built himself on the promises of God. Jesus, in the wilderness as he was being tempted by the devil, Jesus says to the devil in Matthew, the fourth chapter, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of of God. Pastor Dan a few weeks ago talked to us about faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God out of Romans the 10th chapter. Guess what church? You got to talk to yourself audibly. Not none of this. No, 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 no. Faith comes by hearing, which sometimes there's nobody around to talk to you but you. So that means in the name of Jesus, I am a child of God. In the name of Jesus, the Bible says all things that work to the betterment of those who are called according to his purpose. God said that I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. God said, and you start telling yourself, speaking to yourself, talking to yourself. Even if the world thinks you're crazy, you start feeding your faith and stop listening to everything around. We have got to be full of faith. Are you guys with me today? Last one for this morning. Last one for this morning. Because God is faithful, number one, we have to be faithful to God. Number two, we have to be faith-filled. Last one for this morning. We must be faith-focused. Because God is faithful, we must be faith-focused. We must operate in faith. The Bible says Faith without works is dead. So we fill ourselves up with faith. Guess what? Now it's time to turn the engine on because the tank is full. And it's time to start using, putting to work that which we fill ourselves up with. To start operating and living and walking in faith. You see, faith and light are very similar. Light is illuminative, which means it literally shines, it reveals, it illuminates things. It brings things that were once hidden by darkness into sight. Faith is illuminative. It brings things that were once hidden by darkness into sight. It reveals things in our life. As you begin to feed yourself with faith, you begin to say, wow, I didn't realize that I should be like this. I didn't realize that I had this promise on my life. I didn't realize the Bible said this about me or about this about my, my situation. And now all of a sudden light is revealed. But the thing about light is when you take light and you focus it, it goes from being illuminative to incendiary. If you take a magnifying glass on a sunny day and you take that glass and you point it and you hold it in a way that the light that passes through that glass comes into a solid focused beam, it won't take very long for whatever you're shining that light on to become superheated and to come into and, and, and to combust or to start burning. Faith is the same way. When you take faith and you start to focus it, when you start to apply it, no longer does it just reveal, oh, that's cool, wonderful. The promises of God say that? Oh, that's wonderful. I'm a child of God? Uh, the, 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 if God be for me, who could be against me? That's, that's so good to know. But once you start taking that and working at it, applying it, living it, operating it, it's like taking that magnifying glass of the promises of God and focusing that beam onto your children, to your job, to your circumstances, to your life, to your, to your emotions, to your health, whatever it might be. You start focusing that beam of light and it goes from illuminative to incendiary. And it does something in our lives. It begins a reaction and now we live faith focus. That's why the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, we walk by faith, not by sight. Just like faith and light are similar, faith and sight have a direct correlation. 
I remember there was a young man in the young adults ministry who was asking people, if you, could, if, you could, if, you, if you could go see heaven or you could see hell, what would you choose and how would it affect your Christianity? I thought about that for a moment. I thought, you know, I, mean, I think all Christians would probably want to go see heaven. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know about the other thing. But then I thought about it and I said, you know, the hard part about that is that if I was able to go experience and see and, and, and live or dwell in heaven and then have to come back, my faith would be different. My faith would no longer have to be what it was before because now I realize, now I've seen it, now I've felt it, now I've experienced it. But there's a beauty in looking at something that we cannot see, that, that's seeing something that's not there but we know it is, and believing and operating and remaining faithful to it and focusing in on it. Our faith, we walk by faith and not by sight. We cannot look to the left or to the right. We cannot look to what's going on on the side of us or this person over here or that person over there or this church over there or this city over there, whatever it might be, but rather we have got to remain focused in our faith of God and through Jesus Christ. An amazing story, a brilliant story, a, a, just a life-changing when you really grab a hold of this is Matthew, the 14th chapter, Peter walking on water. Matthew, in the 14th chapter, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me, we'll go there, we'll conclude with this today. There's a storm on the sea and the disciples are in the boat and they see Jesus on the water. They don't recognize and they think it's a ghost and they cry out for fear. And Jesus says, hey, it's me, Jesus. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out on the water with you. In verse number 29, Jesus says, come. And Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on water to go to Jesus. Now, I have tried many times to walk on water. <laughs> My dad, Pastor Jim, has a pool. There have been many a time where I have tried to step on the water. Now, you see, I want to point something out here. Peter didn't jump out of the boat and sink. It says he walked on the water. Verse number 20, or verse number 30 goes on and it says... He saw the wind was boisterous. He was afraid, beginning to sink. I've tried to walk on water. You don't begin to sink when you try to walk on water. You sink. So Peter didn't step out of the boat and say, Jesus, bid me to come. And Jesus says, come. And Peter, because it says he cried out, Lord, save me. Next time you go swimming, before you jump in the pool, just step your foot try, and try to say, Lord, save me before you're underwater. You'll get to about, Lord, and then you're done. Peter was on the water, stepped out. You see, he saw Jesus. Jesus said, come, and Peter walked down. He had his eyes fixed on Jesus as he's climbing over the boat. His eyes are fixed on Jesus, and he's looking, and he steps to the water, not worrying about what's going on inside. He takes a step here, and he takes a step there, and he's focused, fixed on Jesus. His faith is aligned with Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, life happens. A breeze comes across his face. What was that? Don't you know, right when your faith is focused, right when things are going on, this is the high point of Peter's life, walking on water, a wind or a breeze comes across his face and distracts him. And so Peter turns, looks away. Faith is focused now on the wind and the waves. And beginning to sink, he starts falling and sinking into the water. He cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately, the Bible says, grabs, reaches out his hand and grabs him. And he says, why did you doubt you of little faith? What happens is we get so misaligned in our faith. We start focusing on, well, that man is the one that can speak to me. I only like it when Pastor Jim preaches. I only like it when Pastor Dan preaches. Or, or that healing minister, he's coming to town. He's the only one that can heal me. He's the only one. That, that guy, his, he has a ministry in, in Africa or in Asia, and I need him to pray for me. What we're doing is we're focusing on the man, not realizing that it's not the man, it's the power behind the man. And what we're doing is looking at the wind and the waves. Stop focusing on the man. I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat with somebody in my office and they started to talk about, well, this is my problem, this is what I've been going through. Start talking about it. After in the conversation, I start to hear, well, you know, truth be told, about a year ago, I went and sat with Pastor So-and-so about this. And I, 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 and, and I didn't get anything out of that. And, and about five months later, I went and pat, sat with Pastor so-and-so about it again. And, and they didn't say anything. And then I went to such and such church and I asked Pastor so-and-so from there about it. And you know what they say? They say, and nobody had the solution for my problem. Exactly. 
No man has the solution for our problems. It's not about Pastor Dan, Pastor Luke. It's not about Reinhard Bonke or Billy Graham or somebody else to get somebody. It is about the power of God focusing our faith, not on the vessel, but on the power that backs that vessel and keeping our eyes aligned with Jesus Christ. It is Jesus who has the solution to our problems. It is Jesus that has the fix to what we need in our lives. And we have got to learn to remain faithful to God to stay with it, to stick it out even when it doesn't look like anything's happening. God is faithful. We have got to learn in our lives to be faith-filled, to feed our faith, to listen to the words of God and not to the words of the world. And we have got to learn to be faithful focused, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and Jesus Christ, to not look to the left or to the right, but rather to look to God, the author and finisher of our faith today. Because God is faithful, we must in turn be faithful to God. Because God is faithful, we must in turn be faith-filled. Because God is faithful, we must be faith-focused. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord this morning? Hey, listen, I want to just do one last thing before we leave. It would be a travesty for us to have service, to, for me to get on you about jumping and shouting and have a good time, to talk about the faithfulness of God and to leave under the pretense that everybody in this room is okay with God when the reality is that there are some of us in this place or some of you in this place that are not. So let me ask you a question, and I want you to listen closely and examine this question in your heart, in your mind. You see, nobody will know the answer except you and God. The question is this, if you were to leave today and your heart were to stop beating and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? You say, well, Matt, Pastor Luke, I sure hope I'd go to heaven. I sure think I'd, I sure think I'd go to heaven. I want to. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you hope you go to heaven, because you think you're going to get to heaven, because you want to get to heaven, that God will look upon you and say, wow, they hoped for it. They, re they really thought they were. I'm they thought so, so, or they really, man, they think, I, I think, nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope, think, or want your way into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have the most positive outlook on life. You live well, you act well, you, you, you look at things and, and, and I have this, this, this joy inside. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't have a positive outlook on life and expect that to get you into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church, because you sit in a chair and hear the pastor preach, because you go to church on Christmas and on Easter or here today, Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you call yourself a Christian, because you serve in the children's ministry or the youth ministry, or you sang in the choir or carried the pastor's Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've given yourself the title of a Christian, your parents told you you were a Christian as a child, you were baptized or christened as a baby. Nowhere does it say that you're going to get to heaven because of those things. You can't get to heaven because you sit in church. God's not after your gold star church attendance record. God's after something more than that. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a good person, because you do good things, you've never done more bad, you've never done real bad in your life, you've done more good in your life than bad, you, you give to charitable organizations, you help out your fellow human? Well, good people go to heaven, we think. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that our good deeds are going to get us into heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because the standard for entrance into, into heaven is perfection. But the Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means every one of us comes up short for being good enough to get into heaven. But there's a solution. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way you and I can get into heaven is God's way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And Jesus, as he was speaking to a religious leader, a man uh, who, who memorized scripture, a man who taught in the synagogue, the church of his day, a man who gave to the poor, a man who did good things by the name of Nicodemus. Talking to Nicodemus about the subject of eternal life, you can read about it in John the third chapter. Jesus, you would think, would say to him, man, you just keep on going. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, in order to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. Now, Hollywood, society, our culture has made us to think that born again means crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. Our society, Hollywood, the world has no concept of God. But from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. 
The Bible tells us in the book of James that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. It's not about your mental ascent or carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. I already know you know who Jesus Christ is. That's why you're here today. But they're not on their way to heaven. It's about giving him all of your heart. It's about giving him all of your life. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. The church. And Jesus says to the church, he's coming back. And when he comes back, he better find us hot or cold. Because if he finds us lukewarm, he says he will vomit us from his mouth. A shocking statement. And what he's really saying is that he better find us in or out because if he finds us right in the line, right down the middle, a little bit up, a little bit down, lukewarm in, our, in, in terms of your relationship with God means not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God, doing some of God's thing or some of the things of God, some of the things of the world. We read about that in the book of James today. Did you not know that friendship with the world, that dabbling over here with the world is enmity or, or, or against God? God's after all of your heart. God's after all of your life. God, forgive us in the American church for watering the message down for hundreds of years. But let me tell you something. There is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ with all of your heart, with all of your life. And I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough. And I honor God enough to tell you the truth of how you and I are to find our way to heaven through Jesus Christ. And Jesus says these words. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. This morning, I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm not sure about heaven. I'm not sure about hell. I've never seen it, never felt it. How do I know it exists? How do I know that, 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 that that's even real? Listen, let's get over that thought. You know full well that there are things in our life, in our world, right here, right now, that we cannot see, we cannot feel, but we know that they exist. Case in point, you know that there are radio waves going from me to the sound booth right now because you can hear the sound of my voice, but you don't see them or you don't feel them. Heaven is a real place, real enough for God to talk about it, real enough for Jesus Christ to teach us about it, real enough for the Bible to be preserved over thousands of years for you and I to read about it and take it serious. God's not in the business of condemning men to hell but rather he's in the business of redeeming men to heaven. But the decision is yours and yours alone. He's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. It is your free will choice. Loves you enough, he does, to give you the decision, to give you the choice, to choose him or not. So Jesus says, if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him, he will deny you. Today, in, the, in this, all across the auditorium, I want to give you the opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do. All across the auditorium, in just a moment, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go, one... Two, on the count of three, I'm going to go three, and smack my hands together. Bang, real loud, just like that. And when I smack my hands together, I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place. And what I want you to do, when I smack my hands together, bang, is I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, you're saying, hey, Pastor Luke, I want to give God my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to get saved. Pastor Luke, I, I, I want to go to heaven. I'm a man, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, I might be embarrassed if I raise my hand. You might be. But let me tell you something, I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, loving place like the church? The decision is yours and yours alone. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you've never, you're in this place and you've never given Jesus Christ your heart. You've never given him your life. Today, if that's you for the first time, if that's you in this place, in just a moment when, when I count to three, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you did this as a child or at a Billy Graham or Harvest Crusade. Maybe you did this in the youth group, but you never really followed through with it or you haven't been going through with it. Listen, if that's you in this place today, haven't been faithful to God, if that's you in this place today, hey, in just a moment, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise your hand? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, this is the moment, this is the day of your salvation. Don't wait another minute. If that's you, in just a moment, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Let's go forward. Let's make today the day you ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. Listen, this is a divine appointment between you and God. You've had dentist appointments and doctor's appointments and DMV appointments and all sorts of different appointments. Now is an appointment between you and God. Don't miss your opportunity today. I'm going to count all across this auditorium, whether you're in the front row, the back row, for those of you guys in the family rooms, if that's you in this place, in just a moment, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. If you're watching online at home, if that's you, get ready. You can pop your hand up at home, and right afterwards, as you minimize your video screen, you'll see a, a blue button that says, No God, want to know God? Click on that button. Wherever you're at in this, around this campus here in the sound of my voice, this is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, don't waste another moment. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see that hand. One, two, three. I see that hand in the family. Four, five. I see that hand. 
Six, I see that hand back there in the back. Six wise people, seven back there. Anybody else in this place today? Seven wise people, anybody else? Where are you at, number eight? Where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number 10? I say, you're saying, I wonder if I should. I see the ushers pointing. Give me a little bit of wave so I can see that hand. Where, I don't see, I don't, the ushers pointing, but I don't see. Where are you at? That's you in this place. I saw that hand in the family room. I got you back there. Seven, eight wise people. I see that hand waving at me, my man. Number eight. Where are you at in this place? Number nine, you say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, this is your moment, this is your time. Stop playing games with God, stop messing around. I love you enough to tell you the truth, to be honest with you, to be in your face about it. It's time for you to get right with God. God's speaking to you right now. If that's you in this place, pop your hand up. Eight wise people, I'm not gonna, I didn't embarrass them, I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? I'm gonna close this down, finish this up. If that's you, come on, where are you at in this place? Is it people pet? Nine, I got you right there. Nine wise people, where are you at? Number 10, man, you're saying, I wonder if I should. You should. You're saying, I wonder if this guy's ever going to shut up. Number 10, where are you at in this place today? Anybody else in this place today? Well, hey, praise God for the nine wise people. Hey, God is good. Here's what we're going to do. For those of you that raised your hand, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you know. In just a moment, we're going to all stand as we do. For those of you that raise your hand, if you're in the family rooms, the ushers will come help you get your stuff. We're going to all stand. If you raise your hand, I want you to get your seat or get your coat, your sweater, purse. You don't have a coat or sweater. It's 105 degrees outside. Get your purse, a friend if you need a friend, whatever you brought with you. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get into the aisle and come meet me. We're going to change destinies together right here. So let's all stand. Please, nobody leave. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. Come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me right here. Let's change destinies together right now. You come. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that you can come. Come on. I breathe. Jesus, I believe. You can come. Come on. If that's you. In you. Jesus, I belong. That's you. Come on, you can come. Let's welcome them as they come. They're still coming. We'll wait for you guys. You can come. Praise God. Yeah, they're still coming. Come on. Hey, listen, guys. Great wonderful, wise decision. This is the best decision you can make as a human being. Did you know that? You just made the best decision you could possibly make. So here's what I want to tell you. Don't, don't worry about that frown. Turn that frown upside down, all right? Today, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. It's your birthday, your new birthday. You're gonna get born again. Here's what we're gonna do. I wanna introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's gonna do a couple things. He's gonna take you guys right over there. Oh, nothing weird goes on. I am as weird as it gets. You made it through me, okay? He's gonna take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, your leader of your life. He's going to give you some free information, some literature. As you walk out of this place, we're going to help point you in the right direction. Where do you go from here? The last thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back and meet with a friend. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will sit with you right here at the church, buy you a cup of coffee, sit down with you, teach you some things right out of the Bible for a couple of weeks to get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from today. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Hallelujah. Woo. God is good. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.